again, as I said before, we've got two transactions that are happening here. One is uh, that there has been a transfer of the property and partial satisfaction of this debt. And so in this particular case, the transfer is considered to be at the fair market value of the property at the time of the transfer rather than for the value of the mortgage. And so we may actually have a loss related to that transfer of the property. The problem, again, related to a personal residence is any personal loss is not tax deductible. So we may have a cancellation of debt because now we've got a partial satisfaction of the debt and the lender has agreed, as we said, as a, uh, in exchange for doing this trustee uh, transaction, uh, to accept the property and, not, and no more. And so now we've got a cancellation of the debt for the part that wasn't satisfied by the transfer of the property. Right, right. Okay. And we also just always have to remind ourselves that there still is, in some of these transactions, a possibility of other income from gain or loss on the, or gain on the transaction because it could possibly happen, I, I, you know, yeah. even, on, even on a property that was worth less than the mortgage because people refinance so much. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's another aspect of all of this is that we lose the parity of all of this when people do this refinancing and they take cash out. And so th that's something that adds to the, the problem uh, of what we're talking here, of having this cancellation of debt related to these uh, short sales and foreclosures. So why don't you talk for a few moments about this new California anti-deficiency statute and, and how it relates to the short sale situation as opposed to the foreclosure situation. Right. Well, we have a new law that became effective in, uh, on uh, July 15th of 2011. And um, there was a law that was passed previous to that that basically said in a short sale situation, if, you, if the borrower got the holder of the note to agree to, to the sale, Mm -hmm. and agree to accept the proceeds of the sale, uh, that there wouldn't be a deficiency. In other words, they couldn't pursue a deficiency on that. That first statute helped for people who only had a, one mortgage on their property, but it didn't help people who had more than one mortgage. The law that passed in July of uh, 2011 says it, if you get the agreement of the lenders, then it doesn't matter if it's a first or a second or a third or, or a home equity line of credit, if they agree to the to the sale, they, there is no deficiency. And it also says that they cannot require the borrower to pay anything extra in order to get them to close the short sale. Mm -hmm. They can't require that. So the idea behind that was to uh, encourage short sales and to get short, short sales closed, especially when you have these multiple mortgages, uh, but it still requires getting the agreement of the, of the lenders. Mm -hmm. The problem we still have is the lenders don't have to agree. Uh, and if they don't, then what happens? Well, if they don't agree, then there's no uh, provision that says the borrower can't offer money to get them to agree to close mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But if that doesn't work, then the property might end up back in foreclosure. And now we have these rules again about they have the option of the second, uh, third, fourth mortgages have the option of pursuing deficiencies against the borrowers. If they do, then you don't have an income tax problem, which is what we're talking about, because they're, they're mm -hmm. still coming after you. Yeah. But if they don't, if they, if they waive it, or you know, if it's resolved in some way, then there's still this potential of cancellation of debt income in a short sales context, just like there would be in a modification or a foreclosure or the short sale. Right. And then, um, so a question that's coming up is, do we think that this changes the character of the loans uh, in other words, the loans that we're saying are recourse mortgages, have they been made into non-recourse mortgages because of this new anti-deficiency statute? Oh, I, I'm not sure about that. I don't, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think you changed the character yeah. of the loan. I think if it started out non-recourse, it probably would be under a short sale. If it started out recourse, it probably would still be. For example, in the case, the other thing about this short, new short sale statute is it applies to not just owner-occupied property, it also applies to rental property. Yes. And so that's, a, that's different, that's different than what oh, happens yeah. under the, under the um, foreclosure statutes. So um, since it applies to these kinds of properties, if, the, if it was recourse financing, which those properties are going to be, right, I don't see that converting the tax consequence, but to be honest with you, I, I don't know that anybody's really... Yeah, yeah. we're not going to have a final answer probably for years because, uh, you know, we'll have to wait to see litigation and other things that are going to happen here. 
but I think one of the things that Bill pointed out is that uh, we have to have the lender's consent. So unless the lender gives consent, uh, then uh, it's still a recourse loan up until the time that, you know, that this final transaction happens. Okay, uh, probably about eight minutes left, Bill. Here we go. <laughs> I understand that there's a federal tax exclusion for cancellation of debt for a residence. Could you explain that? Uh, yeah, back when this crisis hit, uh, this cancellation of debt income issue became real to people. Yes. And the tax consequences, as you know, because we talked to people who were in this mess, they sometimes were quite significant. And um, so there was legislation passed back in 2007, uh, which I think is what you're referring to, that, yes. that's, that allowed uh, people, in, again, in certain situations to avoid the income tax consequences of this cancellation of debt income. And so basically it's a principal residence type of a test. Yes. And, um, you know, you, there were also issues about the way the mortgage was used, what, what, what the money was used for. So there are, there are a lot of rules involved in all of that. But the idea behind it was to allow people, when they were talking about their principal residence, when they had cancellation of debt income after all of this finished being resolved through foreclosure or whatever, mm -hmm. that they could eliminate most, if not all, of the income tax consequence under this statute. California for a while didn't have a statute that paralleled that, but then they adopted one that did with different financial yeah. limitations or monetary limitations. But for most people, you know, the, the average homeowner, this was a pretty good way for them to avoid this income tax consequence uh, for their principal residence. Um, that law was extended once, I think originally it was 2007 through 2009, and then it got extended through 2012, but December of 2012 is now a year away, Yes. and that's, uh, that's I think, an area of concern because we have essentially a year left on that. I haven't heard anything about it being extended beyond that. It's probably going to come up in the conversations in this next year because obviously every time these tax laws come near <coughs> termination, there's a discussion about whether they should be extended. Right. And there's still a lot of people in this, in this problem. Right. Uh, and values are still declining. So there's, there's the possibility of more foreclosures and people, you know, in, in their principal residence who, if, that if this law is not extended, would lose the benefit of that protection and then they would have an income tax problem again. So um, if, if they don't address it fairly soon, they being Congress, this is a federal law, and we know that that in these days is complicated. But if they don't, then I'm afraid there could be a surge in foreclosures where people realize this and they decide, well, I better do something before this law runs out. And even as we stand here a year away from it, it's difficult to get all the way through a process for a lot of these people in a year. Yeah. So I think we already have a potential problem there. Uh, it would be nice if Congress would, would address that and say we should extend this, uh, or, and both in California and federal. but. I'm Write not, your congressman, I'm, folks. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making predictions that that will happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, personally, I don't expect, as I, we were talking about this uh, on the, in the hall, uh, I really don't expect this to be resolved until after the election, unfortunately, and it's going to make it very difficult. Like I said, there, there are going to be many people that are going to be uh, applying pressure trying to get these foreclosures done. The problem is, again, the, the property owner isn't the one that's in control of that process. No. It's really the lender. And uh, so uh, what they decide to do uh, remains to be seen. Um, so again, folks, uh, I'll let you uh, see your uh, tax advisor related to the details of some of this, but California does have lower uh, exclusions related to that. And so, uh, and the properties here, some of the people are dealing with properties with a lot of value, and uh, they may find that some of their mortgage won't qualify. Well, and a couple other things I want to touch on. I don't know what your next question was going to be, but there are a couple other ways that that, um, that people can get benefit uh, from, or tax relief in these situations. Okay. That was the next question, actually. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, if you find yourself in a tax consequence uh, where you owe money to the IRS, um, there are ways of, um, if, you, if you are insolvent, yes. you can make a presentation to the IRS that says, look, I don't have the money, I'm insolvent. And that's another way of uh, exonerating some of that tax liability. So you right. shouldn't avoid thinking about that. Bankruptcy might, might help. The timing of bankruptcy in tax cases, as you know, is important. If you, if you bankrupt out of a mortgage, 
there's not a tax consequence to that. If you get a tax consequence and try to bankrupt out of the tax consequence, it's not right. very easy to do. Right. So if so, if you're going the to mortgage is easier than the, than the tax liability. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So um, yeah. So be aware of this. By the way, there is a uh, an IRS publication on this. I'm not sure I remember. I think it might be 4681. But uh, if you go to the IRS website, it's www.irs.gov. And uh, if you uh, go to the IRS publications and you say uh, title and you put in cancel, uh, this publication will come up and it's free. And so uh, there's some pretty good information in there, again, to sort of help you along, including a worksheet for the insolvency. Uh, situation. Right. And w one other area that you deal with uh, and help people with is um, if it's rental property mm -hmm. uh, and there's a tax consequence, sometimes you can use the deductions and, and things that are, involved, that are involved with rental properties to offset some of that income. And I know sometimes that can be useful as well. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. So yeah, what happens is for a rental property, as opposed to a personal asset like a home, you get to actually get a loss deduction. So, um, so if you have a situation, again, you've got the transfer of the property for less than what you bought it for, um, then you may have a loss that you can claim. It's a business loss, what we call a Section 1231 loss, ordinary loss. You can deduct it against this uh, cancellation of debt income, and a lot of times they'll just wash. So, uh, and you may even have some carryover deductions, so what we call passive activity loss carryovers. Folks, we're out of time. Bill, I want to thank you so much again for uh, coming. Uh, folks, uh, again, we'll have this posted at our website, uh, www.financialinsiderweekly.com, and we also have another uh, interview with Bill where we talk about some of the legal and tax, excuse me, legal uh, and mechanical uh, considerations of short sales and foreclosures. So tell your friends. Uh, you can find it under past episodes at that site. We'll see you next time. I'm Financial Insider Weekly.